Hello everyone, my name is Eric Woods and I'm here today to tell you a wonderful story about a fabulous Belfast man who over 150 years ago uh, kick-started the manufacturing of tea and did the entire industry of tea production and many other things that stemmed from that as well that went right round the world but starting in tea growing areas in India and I'm going to tell you about that first but first I think I should say a little bit about myself and what, how I come today to be uh, in this situation telling you about my uh, story of tea. Uh, as a young man, a very young man, I went to East Africa as a teacher of geography and very quickly uh, was aware of the tea growing that was going on there uh, uh, in the Brook Bond Estates and I got uh, the feel of that taking my school boys to see tea being grown and also uh, produced in the factories. And then quite a few years later I was still working in the education system and for 25 whole years was in and out of Samuel Davidson's own home in Bangor, a place called Seacourt, which uh, we were using as a teacher centre for various events and training. But I wasn't thinking very much about Samuel Davison at the time. I knew about Samuel Davison and I knew about the Sirocco works, but I knew very little more than that. In fact, very few people know much about Samuel Davison in Northern Ireland. It's very strange that one of the most successful businessmen and industrialists in the history of Northern Ireland is hardly known. Uh, people may know and have heard of the Sirocco works which was the name he gave to his factory and to his main products. And I'll say straight away, so that I don't forget later, he called it that because he produced equipment which, which made a hot wind, which he was able to harness in the drying of tea and cocoa and coffee and other products, but also could be converted into a fan to produce heating and ventilation and even air conditioning. And he was demonstrating this fan to someone, how hot it was and how strong it was. And the man turned to him and said, that wind is so hot and strong, it's just like the Sirocco, that hot wind that blows out of the Sahara Desert. And he said, that's the perfect name for my products and my factory. And the Sirocco works, when it was established, sat for all the time of its existence just at the end of where the Queen's Bridge is now, on the county downside, uh, where Bridge End is, and indeed where the railway line now goes across and crosses the Lagan into Central Station. So that was the Sirocco Works. But long before that, in the middle of the 19th century, in 1846, he was born. And as a young lad in the, in the 1840s and 1850s, he grew up in East Belfast. He was born the son of a, a man who was involved in industry and his uncles who were involved in industry. And so he saw various factories working in other products, for example, in a corn mill and also in his uncle's works in Drummond outside Balna Hinch, a great factory for linen uh, flax production, flax uh, processing as the raw material for linen. So he was seen early, early manufacturing processes. At the same time then, he was going to uh, what was and still is a very good school in Belfast, INST as it's called, the Royal Belfast Academical Institution, still going strong right in the heart of Belfast. His father sent him there. But by the time he got to 13 years old, it was considered that that was enough. Uh, so he left, but he did have tutors teaching him over the next two or three years in music, which he's very keen on, and in uh, foreign languages and in drawing um, and he was very quick on the uptake and he learned things like that and he had various hobbies. He became quite interested in photography which is a very early um, at a very early stage of the process of photography and in those days you had to do everything yourself. You couldn't take things along to the shop. You couldn't take pictures on your iPhone and uh, take it along to Boots or somewhere and print them off or even print them off in your own house. There was nothing like that. And so he learned a lot of things just as they were being invented. And somehow, and nobody really knows why, it came into his mind and into his psyche 
that he could think of products and think of better ways of doing things. In the meantime, the British government had started a process in the northeast of India. And this is long before partition, the partition of uh, 1947, which produced India and both West Pakistan and East Pakistan, which were then became East Pakistan, became Bangladesh in, in 1971, after there was a war with Pakistan. Uh, so the, the British government in the, in, the, in the 1850s and 60s was looking at opportunities to invite people from Britain, mostly Ireland, Scotland, Wales and England, but also others to come and take up plots of land to uh, develop the land. And one of the purposes of this was for the growing of tea, which had started a bit earlier, and they were allocating tracts of land in what was really the jungle north of Calcutta in what is called Assam, the province of Assam. And indeed, uh, the area that I'm focusing on in my story about Samuel uh, was more or less just north of the border that the, the government drew between East Pakistan and uh, India. So uh, indeed, the, those of you who know these places will know the name Silet, which was a, a district within that area. And there are many people living in Northern Ireland who come from Silet. Many of them are running restaurants, but there are others no doubt as well. But um, Samuel was in the area just to the north of that border. So he's more or less due north of Dhaka and to the northeast of Calcutta. So uh, at the age of 17, uh, his cousin had already gone there and started this process of working as a tea planter. But at the age of 17, uh, not much older than a normal schoolboy now, in fact, many people at 17 are still in school, off he went. He had his formal schooling ended at 13 and off he went by sea with three other mates from here. And it took an enormous amount of time. It took 66 days because we were going by sea all the way around Africa, right around the south of Africa, because there was no Suez Canal and no other way to get there. No airplanes, of course. And the Suez Canal was not going to open until uh, a number of years later. Later on, we were able to take that shortcut. So 66 days to get to Calcutta, Kolkata as it's now called. Um, but it wasn't over then because there was then a very arduous journey along rivers and uh, along uh, through jungle. And that took three weeks, near, not as long, but that's 20 days or so, be on small boats, on steamers, on uh, bullock carts, and eventually arrived at a place called Kachar, where he was going to work then for the next few years First of all, as an assistant planter to learn the business, and then he would take over and successfully run his own tea garden, as it was called, the tea plantation. And he met various other young men, all in the same boat, if I can call it that, all going out, not to seek their fortune, because there wasn't a great fortune, but it was a very interesting uh, situation to be in. It was certainly very adventurous. Uh, much of the land had been jungle and Often they had to clear the jungle. They used elephants to move the big logs, having chopped them down. And then there was a lot of very hard work to clear the ground to make it suitable for, uh, for tea um, and the growing of tea. And he was very good at this. Uh, and he, was, he managed to stay quite healthy. Two of the lads went with him, frankly, didn't come home. And many people at that point succumbed to a variety of illnesses that today would not be so serious. A cholera, dysentery, blackwater fever, probably they all had malaria. It would have been very, very hard not to have had malaria. But he managed to survive that. He wasn't well all the time. Fortunately for us, he wrote diaries for, for the next six or seven years. He wrote very interesting diaries, which are available today now, copies in the public record office, which is also holding quite a stock of other material highly relevant for Samuel's history. So he's learning the trade, he's learning his business, he's got a boss there, a manager of the estate, and the job is really to grow tea as best they can. But up to that time, tea had been grown 
and manufactured and processed along very traditional lines. It, the, the processing of tea probably started in China six centuries earlier. And this was still the process which Chinese uh, manufacturers and growers had brought to this area of India. And what it really involved was growing the tea, not very scientifically, no real idea about the best way to grow the tea, the best way to harvest the tea, and the best way to process it. And in fact, everything was being done by hand. Like you would make something in your own kitchen at home and did by say hand, but also by feet. Because what they did was they picked the leaves of the, of the tree bushes, which they did uh, prune down to a height, which was about waist high so that people could pick uh, comfortably a few leaves off the top of each plant. Growing wild, a tea tree is actually something like 10 meters high, 30 feet plus. So they found that they could prune it right down to the, in the tea gardens. But what they were doing was they were bringing in the tea in baskets and then in very small quantities in basins over charcoal fires, they were heating the tea. They first of all had to roll it and they rolled it with their feet. So they put their feet in the basin and walked about, rolled back and forth their feet. And then when they'd done that, that broke the leaf and let some of the juice out. They then had to put it in the baskets and let it dry either out in the sun or uh, under a charcoal fire. And that produced tea and you could make it more carefully or not so carefully. But Davison got very interested in how to make it a wee bit better. Would you leave it in the sun a little bit longer or a little bit shorter? It was it important to get it into the works quickly before something would happen to it? He was aware of that and he noted it very carefully. He had no, had no education that was directly related to the growing of tea. Nobody had. Although in fact there were there were engineers around, uh, but they weren't in the tea growing areas. They were manufacturing other things because it was an era, a time in in the West when um, industry was flourishing. It was the industrial revolution really. But as far as tea growing was and manufacturing was concerned, they were still doing the what had stood them in good stead for six hundred years. Davison wasn't really content with this. He became very good at working out ways of making better tea. And as an ex-geography teacher, I'm very impressed by the fact that he had grasped the importance of the slope of the ground, the quality of the soil, what the weather was doing, what the climate was doing, even whether the tea was being grown on the shady side of the valley or the sunny side of the valley. That was pretty sophisticated, for, particularly for somebody who had had no education in those types of issue. But he could see that even if he could improve the growing of the tea and even improve the kind of tea that was being made, uh, they could really make very small amounts of it. He could hardly call it an industry when it was tiny amounts. One of the results of that was that tea was extremely expensive. And in fact, it was a product that only rich people could have. I don't know if you've ever been in one of these stately homes, maybe the National Trust or something like that, but sometimes it will show you a tea caddy and it's got a, a lock on it. So uh, this was because it was so valuable that the lady of the house wasn't prepared to let anybody nick some of it. So what with that, he thinks, can we make better tea? Can we make more of it? And this turns him to saying, can we make machinery that would do that? And by and by, he starts to figure out machines, starting off with, let's get a better kind of heating going and we'll have a better draft. We'll get the air blowing through the, through the tea and that would dry it and heat it quicker. And he knew that a chimney, because he'd seen chimneys at his father's works and his uncle's works, a chimney was one of the best ways, in fact, the only way they had mechanically of making a draft. And the taller the chimney you made, the stronger the wind that would blow up through the chimney. The problem was there's a limit to how much uh, a taller chimney you could make. So uh, that would only worked up to a point. So, but he somehow realized, maybe he watched ladies holding a fan, fanning their faces and realizing that you could manufacture a breeze. So it was then a question, how could you make this breeze stronger? And he started in to play about with fans, probably starting with something like a lady's fan and then 
not knowing what he was really doing. He tried this, that, and the other. He he uh, he just kept going at this until he uh, he started to realize that what you needed was something uh, that that could be turned like with a handle with blades on it that would force the air. And he kept going at that. He had no theory about how you would make a good fan. He just he just experimented and experimented. He couldn't stop. And all of his life, in fact, he just couldn't stop. In the time I've spoken to you, he would probably have invented something else sitting in this room because he'd looked to see, he said, I could make something better. And uh, as it went on in his life, he came to realize, he used to say, an ounce of uh, fact is worth a ton of theory because eventually he, he invented almost by accident, a fabulous fan, which he called the centrifugal forward bladed fan, which the engineers said that can't work because it, it, it uh, the theory of engineering, the rules of engineering, how air moves, that would not allow that fan to work. So he had to demonstrate the fan and show that it did. And he actually took the fan apart and showed them the fan going back together. And here he was away with fans that really could do what he wanted to do. And he was able to manufacture then things, uh, rollers as well. Once he saw he could make machinery at one thing, he could make machinery to do something else. So, so the only thing that, and it's still the case, that he couldn't manufacture was a machine to pick the tea. People have tried to do this, but in fact, it's more like a tractor cutting a hedge. You get no quality out of it. Whereas the, 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 the mantra for tea picking is we pick two leaves in the bud right straight off the top of the tea bush and that gives you the quality tea. In the end of this, he then some 15, 16 years later, he's back home, he's married, he's brought his wife out there, sadly the baby, first baby died eight months later of measles and his wife I think said, she put her foot down and said she was going home. He said, well, okay, I'll come home with you and I'll come back and forward. But after about 18 years, he could see that his business was really going to lie in the manufacturing of these machines. And he came back to Belfast in 1881, he established his first factory, which was really only a shed somewhere there at the end of the Queen's Bridge. He only had eight workers and not seven plus himself. And it was a great success. And he started to send the machinery out to India and, uh, and uh, this took on very well because other, uh, fact, uh, other plantation owners saw they had to use this machinery or they would fall behind, they couldn't do it. And one outcome of this was, in fact, that the price of tea was brought down. This was helped by the fact that Davison didn't like the profits that the tea importers were making in Belfast in Ireland. And he started to produce, bring back his own tea from his own plantation and he manufactured that as his tea and he knocked the bottom out of the tea prices. It went from five shillings a pound down to two. I think two shillings a pound was still probably expensive for the end of the 19th century. But nevertheless, he changed all this. He had his own bonded tea warehouse on the factory, which by now was four stories high and was employing over a hundred men and was really going very, very well. One of the things that helped them was that in Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka, that which had been a coffee growing country, the coffee was wiped out by a terrible disease in the later uh, 19th century. And so it was a ready market for his machinery just when he was ready to bring it because some of the coffee growers who, if they weren't bankrupt, they said, what are we going to grow? Let's try tea. So, uh, so that uh, that's what was a great market. And he established a branch office in Colombo, another one in Calcutta, uh, soon afterwards in America, by, by the turn of the century, he was going into all sorts of things. And he realized these fans could, could uh, be used in heating, in ventilation, in air conditioning, in factories, in warships, in cruise ships, in hospitals, uh, anywhere and everywhere that needed heating or cooling, particularly mines opened a factory later in due course in South Africa because the gold mines were opening up, coal mines were there, they needed fans to keep people cool and they needed to keep miners healthy because it needed to be able to bring fresh air down to lower and deeper pits. So th this became a worldwide industry all under the name of Sirocco. 
which he was very careful to protect because he realized that people could steal his ideas very easily and wipe him out. So he patented all his products and then he took people to court who stole the ideas. We think nowadays of intellectual property theft as being a very modern idea. Not at all. It's probably a long, much older than Davison, uh, Davison's day, but in fact it was around at the time people would steal the ideas or maybe make a very small modification and try to patent that and uh, and wipe them out. Uh, so he protected his his um, products, both in patents, but also the trademark. So Sirocco, they could not use that name because that was his pro uh, trademark and so on and so on. So as time went on, he became an older man. Eventually, eventually he was aged. He passed the factory on to others. Uh, the various factories, and indeed he died in 1921. And you'll realize very quickly that we're not far off 2021. So uh, it's very nice to have this kind of um, information and this publicity about this wonderful man. It's just too bad, I think, that uh, Davison is not so well known. And indeed the modern generation don't know anything about Davison or Sirocco. Older people will still remember the name Sirocco Works because it was very much visible at that point of East Belfast, but not many people would even have known what it was making inside. Uh, it continued to make tea machinery right up until it closed. It closed in 2000 or thereabout, but in fact the rest of the workers went to another premises in part of what was a shipyard. And in the meantime, new factories were, had been built in Australia, in South Africa, America, and India. So that the products were going on. It had been bought over by another company, but that's another whole story. That company was also bought over. And the works in a way are still going strong. Would you believe in China, uh, back to China where the tea started, uh, but it's probably more uh, to do with uh, machinery for in other industrial purposes than for tea. But tea still needs uh, machinery. If you talk to people now in Northern Ireland who've been to the right parts of Sri Lanka or India and they're shown around a tea factory, the chances are they will see old machinery still going strong decades and decades later. And they should take a wee look to see, is it Sirocco machinery? Because much of the machinery in tea estates today in India and Sri Lanka and probably in Malawi and probably in Papua New Guinea and probably in South America and Indonesia and even Russia has Sirocco machinery. One of my friends was in one of these factories last year and it was Sirocco machinery and the manager of the factory was very pleased to hear that they knew what Sirocco was. And my friend said, why are you still using this old machinery? This Sirocco machine is very old. And the manager said, it's still working perfectly. So there you have the story of Samuel Davison, his wonderful Sirocco works and how he kickstarted a major industry which really deserves to be celebrated in Ireland as one of the great products of our country and of the people in it and the men in it, thousands and thousands of men over the years who worked there and had their livelihoods there. What was good this year in February, long overdue, was that a plaque was unveiled to Samuel Davison on the side of a building in Rosemary Street. So why don't you go and see if you can see the blue plaque up on the side of a certain building in Rosemary Street in downtown Belfast. Thank you very much for listening.